Rebecca Omokaru Okolo. I'm the founder of Health Then More and um, the co-founder of Progeny Cerebral Mentorship Program. I started Health Then More in 2015. It's an online community for health professionals from all parts of the world so that we can interact. I share quizzes, I share news, and I share medical information there. And over the years, that since 2015 to 2020, it has kind of evolved into the Dr. Health Then More tutorials. So a little background about me is um, I'm a Nigerian, yes, and I've written and passed the licensing exams in the UK, the USA, and Canada. This means that I have written and passed the PLAB 1, the PLAB 2, the MSRA in the UK, in Canada, I've written and passed the EE, the QE1, the QE2, the NACOS key. In the US, I've written and passed the Step 1, Step 2 CK, Step 2 CS, and the Step 3. And I've also been accept accepted into a postgraduate training program. And so after doing all of this, I felt like it's time for me to like share my knowledge and how I was able to achieve all of this with others coming after me. So I'm um, going to kind of, today is an OSCE skills tutorial because I kind of always talk about exams in in terms of it's all about strategy, right? You can't go into any exam without knowing what to expect and how to do it. So it's not all about knowledge because I'm an IMG, so I know that most IMGs have a lot of knowledge, but we're coming into a different environment, be it the UK, the US, or Canada, and we have to get used to what is expected of us in that environment. So that is why we're having this class today, the OSCE skills class. So I'm just going to... Um, show you this is my handle on instagram you can while we wait for other people to join us if you're on instagram you can check me out at health then more or you can go to twitter or facebook you'll see i've been doing this for over five years so i've been around for a while and my website is dr health then more you can read a little bit about my bio today so in this chat room today, I have about four co-facilitators. We have Dr. Bukumi, which she has written and passed the PLAB 1, the PLAB 2, the MSRE in Canada, the EE, QE1, QE2, and Nakoski. We have Dr. Ebini has written and passed the EE, the QE1, the Nakoski as well. And then we have um, my third co-facilitator uh, is Dr. Tunde. We go way back. We met back on my page on Health Then More in 2015, and we built a very good relationship. Um, he's working in Nova Scotia right now as a physician, and he also went through the steps. He wrote the UK exams, he wrote the Canadian exams, and now he's practicing here. So all of them are here today to support me. So if you have any question you'd like to ask, they will be more than willing to help with that. So that being said, there is no, uh, no other person in the waiting room who will get started. So I would like you to um, please turn your phone on its side um, to landscape mode, right? So you can see the slides, they will be bigger and clearer that way. So a little, I'll give you a minute to do that. So basically what we'll be doing in the class today, we'll kind of try to define what is an OSCE, the kind of things you'll be expected to do in an OSCE, how the OSCEs are scored, the PLAB2, the NACOSCE, the Step2 CS, and the QE2. So when we understand all of this, we can now see the common mistakes that are made in an OSCE station and how you should prepare for an OSCE, then a common history template, and then something very important, which is the Calgary Cambridge Guide to the Medical Interview. Then we'll do two sample cases, and I will explain to you why you should take an OSCE prep course. So are you ready to get started? I'll let my co-facilitator say something at this point so you can know I'm not alone in the room. So I'll leave the floor open to Dr. Tunde. Please, can you um, talk a bit about yourself? Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Tunde Ajayi. Um, yeah, so like she said, we met, you know, um, some years ago uh, on uh, then more and, you know, it was, just, it was in the um, club one exams. <laughs> And uh, yeah, so we met again. It was it was it was just um, coincidence, and you know, it was it was a beautiful one. And we got talking and talking and talking. You know, it's been a long journey. Um, I got to Canada, um, did my um, Canadian exams, and um, also did uh, 
the England exams and, you know, um, say, thank God, now we're here um, practicing as an attending in um, family medicine. Um, yeah, so that's um, all about me. Um, you know, uh, when there's more time to talk, I, I'll give us um, some tips about um, OSCE that, you know, I use, and um, it's pretty simple. I think if I can go through it, everyone can go through it. Thank you very much. So, um, Dr. Ibemasi, would you, do, would you like to say something? Hi, everyone. Like um, Becky mentioned, my name is Eben Musi, Eben for short. And Becky and I go way back since uh, medical school, from there to Lagos, to Canada. And yeah, we've been working together since we started preparing for the exams, basically took the exams together and we've been through the in and out of OSCEs and yeah, all such exams, the technicalities, the clauses involved in the exam. And as she mentioned, it's not simply about knowledge. There are specific things the examiners look out for, the SP look out for. Yeah. So that's all I'll say. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Mm. Ramati. Dr. Bukumi, <laughs> let's hear from you, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Bukumi Ali. Um, Dr. Becky and Dr. Ibin Mwase, we've actually known each other for a while back now. And um, we prepared for all the licensing exams, both UK and Canada exams together. I'm really so much excited to be a part of this project. And today I'll be talking about the common mistakes people make during OSCE exam. And we hope to hear back from you after this class. Thank you. Great. So thank you everyone for your input. We'll get started. So today we'll be looking at the PLAP 2 exam, the Step 2 CS, the Narkoski and the QE2. I'll try to move as fast as possible. If you feel like you have something to say, you can leave it in the chat room. I hope it pops up on my screen. Um, please, my co-facilitators, if there is anybody's chat that pops up, please keep an eye so you can interrupt me and we can attend to the question together. All right. So let's start. So what is an OSCE? An OSCE simply means it's an objective structured clinical examination that is often used in health sciences. What happens is you go into a station, you meet an actor who is acting like a patient and you treat the actor like you would a real patient, get the history, examine and manage the patient as you would a real patient. So, um, the next thing is, um, let's get in the mind frame of an OSCE. You know, I like to say that, the best person to tell you how a journey is, is someone that has been in that journey. Like they know, who, who is the best person to tell you about an OSCE? The person that has just written an OSCE, right? They know how it feels like, what it means to interact with the patient. So let me give you a picture. Let me paint a mental picture for you. You get to the OSCE place, they give you your sheet. Next thing you're on the long line, you're standing with your back to the door, and they tell you, do not read the instructions. Then you have like two minutes to read the instructions and you walk into the room, you face two people. One is sitting down with an expressionless face, like, what are you doing? And the SP is like, yeah. So you're the next guy that wants to come in and ask me questions. Don't ask me something stupid, right? And then your heart is beating, your hands are shaking, you're getting so much information and you're like trying, I hope I can remember all of these. Then you have to synthesize everything and then, comport yourself in a professional manner that will instill confidence in that SP. Now there's a secret people don't know in the exam. It's kind of one of the mistakes, but I'll tell you at this point, when you go into an OSCE, never assume that you're there to impress the examiner. That is something IMGs always think. You feel you're there, you, want, you have to show you are knowledgeable. You have to impress the examiner, but did you know that the SP actually tells the examiner what they think about you. What impression did they have of you? Because these SPs are like real patients, right? So if the SP felt like you did not treat them right or they didn't feel comfortable with you, they're going to tell the examiner, mm -hmm, 
I didn't like that doctor. Mm -mm. It's going to really affect your mark. So always be in the mind frame that I'm not here for the examiner. I am here with a patient. How do I make this patient feel better? It's all about making your patient feel good. It's not about the examiner. The examiner is observing your interaction. So don't be in the mental space where you're interacting with the examiner and the SP is in front of you. You, are, you should be interacting with the SP and the examiner is watching you. So that is the mind frame you should be in. So after three stations of doing all of this, you're exhausted, your brain starts to ache. And if you're not well prepared, you're going to make more mistakes because like the Narkoski, there are no breaks. You go from station one to two to three to four and you're like, why is the break you promised me? And it's all over. That's the end of this exam. So um, we'll move to the next thing, which is in the OSCE, every candidate will ex experience the same problem. Like you will all do the same task. You all do the same thing. So it's not like one person faces one thing and you are not facing that thing. So one, um, it's in the OSCE mistakes, right? Some people will say, but the, the SP did not tell me this thing. The SP did not tell you that because of the way you asked the question, right? The SPs are not there to give you everything. And just when you come, you just say, what's, what's your, your issue? And the person, the SP just starts saying, Brrr, no. Some SPs are, they, if you do not appear sensitive to what the SP needs or how they are feeling, they don't have to tell you anything. So be careful about that in the exam. That's why most people will be like, she didn't tell me this. I didn't experience this. It's your attitude. That's why you did not experience that. So um, we're moving to the next one. Now, this is the little secret in an OSCE. This is the way not to fail. To pass an OSCE, this is just it. You must prove that you're a thorough, efficient, and safe physician. You cannot make fatal mistakes concerning your performance or the patient safety. This means whatever you're doing, don't do something. Maybe you're supposed to put a chest tube in the second intercostal and you say, I'm going to pass into the lung. Like, you can't pass the station. So you must, whatever you're doing, you have to prove that you are safe. That is it. So let's go into the OSCE station. What are the kind of things you may be asked to do in an OSCE station? You may be asked to take a history. You might be asked to do the history and examine. The patient might have a concern that is not medically related and you're to resolve that. It could be a complaint. You might be an emergency situation, like especially it's coming into the NACOSCE now, but usually it was in the QE so you do the emergency station. Then you might be asked to counsel a patient or a family member. Um, in the QE2, you know it's a couplet station, right? So the second station might have some written questions you should fill in, or it could be a multiple choice and so on in the QE2. Then you might be asked to summarize and present your findings. And this is one area IMG struggle. When they say present a case to a colleague and then you go, the patient is a 35-year-old male presented with this, this, this. No. It's not a long history presentation. There's a mnemonic you should use to present your cases. But if you see all the slides, we can't go into that right now. So let's keep going down. Then you should maybe ask to read some materials before you see the patient and then relate the results to that patient. You may also be asked to um, interact with other physicians or healthcare professionals. It could be a nurse. And number 10, the list is not exhaustive. There are some stations that may require more than one of these um, tasks. Okay, so let's discuss the PLAB 2 exam. So the PLAB 2 exam is made up of 18 scenarios. They last for eight minutes. Um, simple thing is, one thing about the PLAB 2, what I found different from Canada and the US OSCE was, you really don't have a daughter in the PLAB 2. So whatever the patient is telling you, you kind of have to put it in your head and then recall it. If you're lucky, there might be a paper, but I, tend, I can tell you if you find a paper, it's likely for explaining something. So don't use it like really for the history taking, right? You should be explaining something, drawing a diagram or something. Now, what does the PLAB2 cover? It's basically what a UK trained F2 should see. That's at the level of a house officer, spending two years in house job, that's what the PLAB 2 should cover. So there'll be a lot of informing your seniors when you face a difficult scenario. I should pause at this point. Does anyone have any question?
um, co facilitators, is there any question in the chat room? No. Okay, great. Um, so let's see. Oh my. So the the following are the skill sets that you have to exhibit in the OSCE because the OSCE is a test of skills. It's not a test of knowledge alone. It's a test of your skills. So you they're, they're checking how you consult, how you reach your diagnosis, your examine, how you check, make your findings, the issues. There's always an issue, especially in Canadian exams, Canadian OSCEs, there is always an issue. So if a patient is coming with uh, abdominal pain, you'll be surprised to find out the issue is that her boyfriend is beating her. So don't focus on, oh, abdominal pain. I'm going to finish this station. I know everything about abdominal pain. The real issue in that station is the boyfriend beating her. And if you do not address that situation, you cannot pass the station, right? Because that means if a patient comes to see you in real life, you are going to let the patient go back to that abusive um, relationship without finding out. So it's all about you finding out the issue in that station. Then your language, how do you use your language? What kind of things, how do you talk to your patients? So in the, I found out that especially in the North American setting, they're very particular about the language. I'll give you an example. I once went to buy coffee. The Nigerians can relate to this. And I said, I want, give me another cover. And the guy was like, cover? I was like, yes, cover. Look, I was pointing like, cover, cover, cover. And the guy said, cover? I was like, it's cover for crying out loud. Then finally, he was like, oh, you mean lead? I was like, yeah, lead. <laughs> so that's just it, right? Your language in the exam is very important. You should say the right things, the things they expect you to hear. So like, sometimes you have to actually cram some phrases. You don't think, oh, I can speak English. So this is how I'm going to say my own thing. No, there is an appropriate way, the way they say it in the setting, the, the clinical setting here. And that's how you should also say it. So um, the next thing is, this is how they mark. Now, why I put all these scoring sheets up is for you to understand that, um, for you to understand that, Every skill is important in an OSCE. Now, this is the plateau scoring um, sheet. When the when you pass or fail a station, the examiner will identify where the issue is. Was it in your consultation? Was it the diagnosis? Was it the examination? The findings? The issues? The language? So all these are skill sets, and you should make sure that you're up to date, up to speed on all of them. I'm really sorry, the screen is shifting this way. So now this is the mark sheet this there are two ways two um kind of the way you know those that have done the canadian oscar know that they give you the your sheets like the regular score then they give you the supplemental score sheet so now this is the first one where they, the uk will tell you station one you pass station two you fail station three you pass station four you failed so let's look at this one there are three domains that are marked in this oscar and one is the data gathering, which is basically your history taking. How did you take your history and all of that? Were you able to um, note the important things in the history? Then the second thing is the clinical management. How did you manage the case? And then the third domain is the interpersonal skills. Like, how did you relate with the patient? So it's not, and if you look at the score sheets, all the, the three domains are a maximum score of four which means that your data gathering is just as important as your interpersonal skills. So I find out that as IMGs, when we're taking our, when we're doing our OSCEs, we tend to, um, we tend to always, how I put it? We tend to always focus on history taking. Nobody's telling you, I don't like the way you talk. Um, you should watch how you're addressing the patient. So, but you should understand, and I will show you in the three score sheets, both from the PLAB2 to the Narkoski to the QE2 to the CS, that interpersonal skills, communication skills are just as important. They carry the same weight as your data gathering skills. So now this is someone that scored a four in data gathering. 
The person scored a one in management and scored a four in interpersonal skills and he got a nine. Did you see how that worked? Imagine if he had gotten two in the interpersonal skills. So that would be one, four plus one, five plus two in interpersonal skills. That's seven. A total score of seven in this station would mean this patient would, I mean, this candidate would fail that station. So that is to say that if you improve in all the areas, you can ace your OSCE. Do not focus just on history taking. So we'll move quickly. So just a minute. Yeah. So let's go on. We've talked about the PLAB 2. So like I said, an OSCE is like a menu. You must have a taste of all the dishes before you leave the restaurant. Every area will be tested. So you cannot neglect one area. Imagine if three domains had up to 300 marks, 100 marks each. If you're able to gather 60 marks in each area, you get a total of 180 over 300. But if you work on only two areas and get 60 in those domains, you can only get 120 over 300. That's a difference of 60 marks. You get my point. So that is why at Dr. Health Demo Tutorials, we advocate a balanced approach to preparing for an OSCE to improve your chances of passing with your expected score. You need to understand that each domain is just as important as the others. So now we're done with that. We've talked about the PLAP 2 exams and all of that. I said, I wrote, do not underestimate the PLAP 2, prepare sufficiently, <laughs> even if you have previous OSCE experience. Um, so we've talked about the PLAP 2. Let us move at, let's look at the Canadian OSCEs and how they are scored, right? So NAC OSCE, we know it's all about getting into residency. And this is the current marking sheet for the NAC OSCE. Now look at just the way we talked about the PLAP 2 in the UK. Assessment and diagnosis is a domain. Management is a domain. Communication skills is a domain. Now each of these domains carry equal marks. Do you understand? Now, so if you're working on just history taking all the time, you're working on that management all the time, that is two out of three. And with the um, Nakoski changing to a pass, fail, pass with superior performance, those that will get pass with superior performance have to be good in all three domains. You cannot get the superior performance if you're focusing just on two domains. So this, that's the current marking sheet. Now, this is the former one way back. Look at how the domains were scored. Communication skills, data interpretation, diagnosis, history taking, investigations, language fluency. Look at all of these. History taking is just one band. So why do we spend all of our time on history taking? That's how we prepare for us. We keep on taking history, 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 history. And you want to know all the history. It's just one band. That's what it is. Now, food for thought. Are you confident that your present OSCE skills will help you achieve a pass with superior performance? Think about it. So, with that said, let's move to the QE2. Now, these are the um, this is how the QE2 result is scored, right? You have the physician activities and you have the dimensions of care. Um, the physician activities means basically what should a physician do when a patient comes in to see you? And like you'll see, actually, there are four domains in physician activities. Your assessment and diagnosis, your management, then communication and professional behaviors. I mean, that's all tied them into one band. So in, in, in Canada right now, they've made it like communication is in two bands in a way. Assessment, that's all the history taking, how you arrived at your diagnosis. It's just one band. Management is one band. Then communication is like two bands. So anyone going to a Canadian OSCE and you do not have communication skills, like really good ones, like really good ones, it's really, really kind of, difficult to pass the exam. So a little secret, like I, I actually failed my first QE2 exam and I was very, very troubled because I didn't know what I was going to do to improve myself. Like, what, what, how am I going to make it through this QE2 debacle? 
But I went back. I improved my communication skills very well. I then I studied more about the exam. I understood the domains, how to improve my professional behavior, my communication, my management. And then when I went back for the exam, I passed it. Right. So going for an OSCE is not just about knowledge. It's about being a well-rounded physician all round. Now let's look at the dimensions of care. Basically, it means that when you are telling the patient what to do, there is the what we say in our study group will say pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic. But now you can guide yourself using this um, this marking scheme. It means when you want to manage any patient in an OSCE, you should look at how do you promote the health of this patient. Are you going to tell the patient to lose some weight, to stop smoking, someone with heart disease, for example? Then in the acute care, like what are you going to do right now for this patient to help the patient feel better? What are you going to do in the long term for the patient to keep the patient on the path to good health? Then the psychosocial aspects, like I said, there's always an issue in every station. You have to find out that issue. So you have to make sure it's as a family physician, we all say the patient should be well rounded. Like your care should, you're taking care of all the dimensions of the patient. So that is ex exactly what this score sheet tells you about the marking scheme and what you sh what is expected of you as a family physician. Because the key is to assess you being entering into ind independent practice. So I'm not going to dwell too much on that. Um, we'll go to dimensions of care. Basically, the same thing. We've explained all of that, the physician activities. Now we go to the... Doc, second. hold on. There's, there's a question. Okay. Yes. So the question is about how to improve professional skills. Then if this is the scoring and grading... If, sorry, if the scoring and grading is the same in the QE1, so the first thing is the QA1 is more, first of all, is divided into two parts. The first part is multiple choice question. Then the second part is um, clinical demonstration. That's hypothetical situation to manage the, the patient. Or it's more or less like um, a theory, theory, theory-ish type of um, examination. So it really doesn't, this marking system really doesn't apply to the QE1. The only relevance is in managing every patient, it has to be psychological, uh, biopsychosocial. So like the medication itself, psychological aspects of the treatment, for example, if the person needs counseling and stuff like that, then social. So things in the community that may aggravate or alleviate the illness. Then if it's professional skills, things like um, discussing with your colleagues are things that are tested in the QE, QE2, in the Narcoski, as um, Becky mentioned earlier, because there are stations where you have to report your findings to a colleague. For example, you may see an emergency case in which the person has acute appendicitis. And the second half of that station, you are going to discuss with a surgeon what's going on. And the surgeon may even give you an excuse that, oh, I'm sorry, I'm in the operating room at the moment. And at that point in time, you have to take charge of managing the patient. And you would have to show your competence and your profession now. Another area could be maybe a nurse reports your colleague to you that your colleague is drunk at during clinic hours. How are you going to handle such a situation without overreacting, like a justified way of managing it? Or like a case that just came up recently where a surgeon put a noose to intimidate another person working in the same department as him. So if you are in such a situation, how are you going to handle it? So those are things that test on professionalism. Or if someone should come and meet you and request for opiates, how are you going to handle such a case? So yeah, there's a professional standard. There's a way the Canadian system expects you to handle such situation. So 
Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Benmase. Um, I think, Becky, the question was directed to you. You know, when you had mentioned your second attempt on QE2, you said you improved your professional skills. So the president is asking, how did you improve your skills? Well, so if you have more examples to add. Okay. Um, basically, in my first, uh, when I did my NAFOS key, I wasn't aware of all of these plans. I just felt I should just go into the exam, take a very good history, take a, do my normal management and all of that. But it wasn't until, I, because by the time I failed my QE2, I had, I had passed my CS and passed my NAFOS key. So the QE2 really threw me back, like, what is wrong with me? Like, why can't I pass this exam? I didn't really know how to figure that out. So what I did was I worked on it. Yes, I worked on my knowledge. I worked on my communication. I worked on my professional behavior because honestly, I would tell you the truth. Anybody going for QE2 and you're going into that exam without communication, good communication skills or professional behavior, your day two is basically going to be all about professional behavior and communication. Ask those <laughs> that have gone for QE2. It's going to be you going from interacting with the patient, counseling the patient, to counseling your colleague, to presenting a case. It's also basically to pass QE2 right now. It's not going to be about your knowledge. So for me, I'm just showing you the bands and I've told you what to do. Like you have to communicate. Use the la appropriate language in the North American setting. So if you want to learn how to do that, you have two options. You can research about it. You can go for observerships or work in the hospital, learn, look at, observe the um, system, or you could join my tutorials where I will share it with you. Did I answer the question now? Yes, I think that's all. You could go ahead. Thank you. So, um, Becky, I yeah. think your microphone is low. We can't hear you well. Oh, really? Yes. Oh, I don't it know seems to be better now, though. Ah, okay, 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 okay. All right, so let's move on to the Step 2 CS. So in the Step 2 CS, um, you need to, this is it. This is it, Step 2 CS. Now, The, there are three bands just as well. So we've looked at the UK exam. We looked at looked at the Canadian exam. Now we're looking at the US exam. Let's look at the left bottom corner. It says ICE, CIS, and SCP. Now, the ICE stands for Integrated Clinical Encounter, right? That means all your assessment and data gathering, your, even all your putting your notes in the computer after the station, it's just one area. Just one. Now your CIS is your communication and interpersonal skills. It's a whole band. Then your spoken English proficiency is another band. You can say this is just like Canada sort of now. Communication is a huge chunk of an OSCE. It's a very huge chunk. Now all the data gathering, all the assessments you're doing, everything that you're, we spend all our months preparing for, it's just one band out of numerous bands that will be assessed in that exam, right? So now, in the step two CS, once you fail one band, you failed the exam. So if in this kind of situation, this patient had good, I mean, this candidate had good communication skills, had good English skills, but could not scale through the clinical encounter, which is the history taken at the patient's nose, and the overall outcome was a fail. So it's a, a test. This is to tell you that you cannot focus on communication and leave your history. You cannot focus on your history and leave your exam and your, leave your communication. It's a test of a range of skills. So that means you should have a balanced approach to developing yourself. That is how, see, I have, after I've developed myself in terms of communication, I listen to some IMGs when they're taking the history. And I'm like, hmm, so that was how I sounded. Trust me, when you meet um, a candidate that is not, doesn't have good communication skills, they, they will, they will, you'll know them about. And you should know that the QE2, you compete with Canadian residents. 
That means these are residents that are in the hospital all the time. They know what is expected of them. They know how it's done. That's who you're standing toe to toe with. So if you are not able to perform at a level similar to them, it was different back then. It was all about knowledge back then. But since October 2018, things have changed. It has things have really changed because they I used to say they've identified the weakness of the IMG's communication and they are zooming in on it. So if you don't want to be caught off guard, get a balanced approach to your OSCE. So let's move on from the step to CS. So at this point, I believe I have been able to convince you that communication skills carry an equal weight with history taking and management on any OSCE station exam in the USA, UK, Canada. Many people underestimate the importance of communication and interpersonal skills, but if you want to stand out on an exam with exceptional results, you can't afford to have poor communication skills, regardless of how excellently you perform in your history and management. Now, common mistakes make Dinanoski. I'll leave that to Dr. Bukumi. Okay, um, thank you very much. I think, um, Dr. Becky, you spoke a lot about about the common mistakes in OSCE. So the first one is talking about not reading the instructions carefully. Just have, bear in mind that at each station, there is something they want to see. So um, in each station, you have a task as a candidate. What are you expected to do? Are you supposed to take an history alone? Are you supposed to assess a patient and manage the patient? And you know, when it comes to assessment and managing the patient, it involves a lot of things. You have to do your history. You have to examine your patient as well as um, asking for some investigations and also managing the patient and sometimes the management involve like your immediate management what are you doing at that time then asking too many questions as high mgs we are used to trying to ask all the questions possible in a rapid manner like you know you have to be your approach has to be clinical you have to know what you're doing right and in this way when you are asking questions you want to have a bit of differential diagnosis even if you are not making a diagnosis at that time the examiner wants to see that you have a list of diagnoses you you are thinking in mind that's what they are testing in this station then misinterpreting instructions is very important that when you are in a station right you want to identify the problem of the patient and with the problem of the patient right you want to address it at that time so you don't want to like just go into an exam and probably misinterpreting what the question or what the instruction is telling you for example if they ask you if um there could be a case of abdominal pain and you know you know that the pathology might not necessarily be in the abdomen. It might be in other system. So in that case, even if you've done your abdominal examination, you might not get all the scores that are required because you have missed other system that could lead to your diagnosis. Maybe you have to check the mouth. You have to check other things in the hands, the feet, and all that. Then also asking, um, Dr. Becky spoke about um, your language. You have to be very careful about your language in the exam. Using too many directed questions, you have to like give the patient an opportunity to talk. When you're taking an history, it is like you are communicating with a patient. So you want to use open-ended questions. For example, tell me why you are here. You know, can you describe um, the pain for me? At that point, is open-ended. So the patient is able to give you as many information as possible. Then when you want to ask them, you are not making it too directed or close-ended that, you know, the patient is just there to tell you yes and no. Always have at the back of your mind that when you are having us um, in an OSCE exam, it's just like your regular interaction with your patient. You want to hear them. And at that point, when you have like, when you are asking them open-ended questions, they are able to relate better with you and tell you what is going on. 
Also, um, it's important for you to listen to your patient. I had talked about... Um, Sorry. Um, Sorry, let me say something. Can I say something? Yeah, sure. I have a little trick. and uh, Let me just share with you. Whenever you are in an OSCE station, listen to your voice. When you find out you're talking too much, like you're, you're asking questions and it's like you are the one covering the conversation. You're doing it wrong. Stop, stop, stop. 